detail from the belly dancer. It's a, a picture of full maturity and great and great kip. And you can see the details are quite wonderful. This is the belly dancer's arm. There's a sleeve. He must have been looking at Rembrandt before he painted that sleeve. He borrowed from everyone right and left. And that's perfect academic uh, practice. The next one, please. Here we come down. Well, not, there's a, a sort of a, a veil that's made out with coins tied to it. This incredible breast poking way through the, through the blouse. Um, and you, when you go to the show, you'll see people just stepping up and putting their nose in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see, may I have the next, please? <laughs> Undoubtedly, he, he, he was in um, North Africa, and he uh, hired an Albe for poses, photographed her, sketched her, and then bought her costume, and probably other services. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have the next, please. And then you look around, there's all sorts of incredible detail. There is her skirt, and you'll notice there is a foot sticking out from someone who's watching in our room. And the foot, has a t the, the foot is really good. It has the tension of a foot sticking out. And you can believe there's a leg, uh, leg behind both of them. But again, the next slide, please. Oh, here's another person, a, a Bashi Bazook, as they would call them. Those are irregular troops who just got in the bob of the battles for the, the loot. And notice this, it's in a room. There's light coming in. There's always a bright light somewhere. And, it becomes a, and the costume is seen with great detail, with great length. He's an incredible draftsman. It's very hard to get away from something like this. But may I have the next, please? When you look at the whole picture, it becomes quite different. This isn't a terribly good slide, but you get to see the original at the Getty. And she is enclosed in a room of atmosphere. The details are controlled so well by values that they all stay in place. You're looking at it up close rather distorts it. But this was my fault, too, from just thinking about drawing all the time and not thinking how one... Uh, it, uh, important coloring was. I noticed that he used strong local colors and used them in patterns to build up the composition, but I didn't know how thorough his color was. Next, please. You may, then the other thing that, uh, one thing that bothered me about the exhibition, it's not set up chronologically. See, I'm a real art historian, I want to see the development, but set up by topics. And this is the first painting that made the painting that made him famous. He had tried for the Roman Prize, the Prix de Rome, at the Academy, and didn't get very far. He was told his drawing was bad. His teacher, <laughs> Dela, his teacher Della Rose, said, "Go do a drawing with two big figures in it that'll be seen on the wall." And probably with Della Rose's help, and maybe with his other teacher, Master Glare, he painted this big picture five feet across. It was skied, as they say, hung up very high, but it was noticeable. You can imagine how bright it is. There's a lot of yellow in the picture. Um, and that would stick out from all the bituminous dark pictures of the, of the academicians and the other people uh, in the show. It's a cockfight. It's very interesting. Jerome was a classical scholar. He knew that the term cock, uh, cock teasing meant the same thing in Greek as it does now. Uh, the reason is because uh, the handle on faucets in antiquities were in the form of a rooster. Uh, so it's just come down in the language. Uh, it's curious there should be two boys running the cox, not the, the, the girl is probably not in charge of it. So it's a little erotic that she's there. The, this picture got into trouble with all the critics. The Realists thought, well, the only thing that's real in it, and this is the beginning of realism, 48, 47, they like the roosters best of all, and they are really <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> the formal academicians would say, five foot across, and it's a genre picture, a picture about everyday life. It's trivializing antiquity. You're only supposed to have subjects of moral and religious importance in this size. 
And Courbet had the same trouble the next year when he exhibited the after dinner at Ornans. It was people sitting around a dinner table in a huge shape. The picture has some trouble with it. If you get back a long time, you might get tired of the drawing of the boy, but it seems quite wonderful. The girl is outlined with a very beautiful outline, but non-descriptive. She looks like several sacks of flour piled on top of each other. <laughs> very little articulation. Two reasons are uh, behind this. One is just the, the academic or the tradition in, in art painting for centuries that women are pale, that they don't have bone structure in their face and they're covered with fat. <laughs> and the hot, you would think it, at an academy that would be corrected, but female models were not tying his, uh, tying his sandals. The back comes from that. It's a very good, beautiful back. It's articulating both I mean, with great knowledge for a young man the muscular and the bone activity coming down the back of the spine. This picture was copied hundreds of times. You can always tell the copy because the, the copy just puts a straight line, a curved line for the back. Now, and then the, the um, background looks a little like it's wrapped around. It's, it's not such an integral pic picture. But this doesn't matter. The picture is so beautiful. And after all, he was 23 when he painted it. So what, what more can you ask? And it still is a famous and wonderful picture. Now, John Spyhart thinks he got his stuff together. Let's see the next slide, please. With a picture from 10, ten years later, the famous duel after the ball. Now you can see, if you look, and even in this slide, you can see the color integration. The, the, the local colors of the costumes are strong. They form a good pattern. And the colors are reflected in the snow, in the sky, a, a real ambient tonality is there to back up the pictures. And we know this pic we have enough documentation on this picture we can see how J Jerome worked. First he made just a quick pencil sketch, four by six or something like that on a piece of paper of the main group and put in the main groups and he put in a little drawing for the background. Then he would get models and put them in costumes these he could have rented because they're all costumes used at balls would have models pose in them one at a time and then put them together in this wonderfully interlocking composition. Then he would make a sketch and make an oil sketch. And he'd already done sketches of the, of the Indian who's kill, done the killing. You see from all the feathers on the ground, he was fighting with Piero. Um, and then he would make oil sketches and pencil sketches where the big problem was the relationship in space between the two groups. The main group has to dominate, but it has to lead to the secondary group. And the color scheme has to hold them all together. There are many, many oil sketches for this, and the, the, the two people in the background move forward and back. Finally, he had the coat of one linking them. But it comes out, it's quite a beautiful picture. There are three replicas painted by Jerome of this. One, the great one is in Chantilly, great museum just outside of Paris. Another is in Moscow. That was ordered by the emperor of Russia, so he couldn't very well turn down the offer. And then a third one was ordered by Mr. Walters of Baltimore. And this is the weakest of the, of the three. In the show, there is a sketch, an oil sketch about this size, very tiny, probably a preparatory sketch, because he made these oil sketches one after the other, what looked like shoot, uh, cigar box covers trying all these color schemes out. And when he got it right, he would paint, work on the big picture. Uh, and that sketch must be a very close to this or done afterwards. It, it is tighter and better. The main thing, if you study it, you'll see, and I don't want to ruin this picture, but it, he does, the weight in the Piero isn't so strong. He doesn't slump with the sense of death so strong as in the, um, the version. Jerome's already occupied with this, the, that when you die, that's the end of it. He's not interested in the heroic themes and angels coming down to show that martyrs are going up to heaven. He doesn't believe any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So he's already changing of some of the, of the, of the uh, academic theory. But he always has a subject that has to be thought about, and he expects you to look at the picture for a while. He also expects you to stand back at a lot, about two widths of the picture to see the perspective. That's how he would look at the picture while working on it. Let's have the next, please. I want to show you where he learned about women.
constituary in the Louvre. This is a, on the right, uh, on the left is a statue that exists in many, many copies of they, probably the, the Proxiteles of Venus emerging from the bath. And this figure appears in painting after painting. Right? This was a simple, small breast, um, anatomy simplified by sweeping beautiful lines on the outside, really very linear. And it wouldn't be until he was old enough to pay for models himself that he could work with real nudes. Next, please. Here, for instance, is a famous picture. Now we've, we've gotten out of the chronology. He's, he's developed his style, and he's going to be a, you know, a great hitter. Everything's going to hit the mark after this. This is a famous story from antiquity about a famous courtesan or prostitute of, Par of Athens who committed a sacrilege by undressing and, and swimming, stepping into a pond on a sacred day. She was brought to trial before the Areopagus, a group of old men who we see. It's on the hillside across from the east side of the, from the west side of the Parthenon. And her lawyer defends her with what would be a platonic argument or a neoplatonic argument. He rips her clothes off and reveals her and says, can anyone this, be, this beautiful be guilty of a sacrilege? <laughs> and he wins the case. <laughs> and you'll see that she's very much the Praxitilian Venus with the arm raised up again. But well, this was um, th this the kind of, uh, trouble with females that exists for a while. May I have the next, please? <laughs> 